Guys, the debate has been raging for years. Does increased blood flow improve hair growth? Does reduced blood flow cause hair loss? Are they even connected? Does it even matter? In this video, we're gonna look at all the evidence from both sides of the argument so that you can make the most informed decision on your hair loss moving forward. All right, with all that said, let's get into it. The first strong evidence that blood flow is a key factor in baldness came with the introduction of topical minoxidil in the 1980s. Minoxidil is a vasodilator. In other words, it dilates the blood vessels, allowing more blood to flow through them. The result is an increase in the blood supply to the scalp and eventually hair regrowth. Using advanced techniques like laser Doppler velocimetry, scientists have actually documented and quantified this increase in blood flow. As you'd expect, the effect is more pronounced with a stronger 5% formulation, resulting in roughly a threefold increase in blood flow. The problem is that minoxidil's effects only last about an hour to an hour and a half, which is probably why most formulations require twice daily application. Having said that, minoxidil will actually regrow hair, not just on the scalp, but anywhere that you apply to on the body. Which brings us to a key point, that blood flow is critical to hair growth, is nothing unique to the scalp. Hair loss can occur anywhere in the body where the proper supply of blood is impaired. For example, there is a condition called peripheral artery disease, which usually affects the legs. Due to the buildup of plaque on the vessels, the supply of blood to the legs is severely affected. And one of the early warning signs is that the hairs on the leg begin falling off. The skin's texture can also change and it can become more smooth and shiny. Is this starting to sound kind of familiar? There are also distinct patterns of hair follicle vascularization, which is the process by which blood vessels form and grow around the follicles. This vascularization is far from static during the hair follicles growth cycle. During the antigen growth phase, when the follicle is actively growing and pushing out the hair shaft, the degree of vascularization in the surrounding tissues increases dramatically. But during the telogen resting phase, when the follicle is basically waiting to die and to be replaced by the new follicle, the extent of vascularization drops up to four times compared to the antigen. These differences apply to healthy men's hair without hair loss. But in men with baldness, each successive hair cycle results in even smaller follicles while their degree of vascularization progressively decreases. Eventually, this decrease in blood flow reaches such proportions that the degree of blood flow in the scalp of baldy men is over 2.6 times lower compared to healthy controls. The scientists who made this discovery concluded, and I quote, growth and regrowth of the hair in the scalp depends on a sufficient nutritional blood supply to the hair follicles. The significantly reduced subcutaneous blood flow to the scalp of patients with early male pattern baldness, as found in this study, might explain the loss of hair and the inability to regrow hair. In line with this, other scientists discovered that baldy men exhibit decreased blood flow, not all over the scalp, but only at the frontal part of the scalp that is actively balding. Their blood flow to the sides of the head, which is impervious to balding, remains normal, but men without hair loss show no such differences. Their blood flow levels are the same across various areas of the scalp. Other converging lines of evidence come from very successful baldness treatments that have been discovered since finasteride. In one way or another, these are all linked to blood flow. One of these interesting treatments is called platelet-rich plasma, or PRP for short. This involves drawing a small amount of the patient's blood, which is then processed to increase the concentration of platelets. Platelets are blood components that contain growth factors essential for healing and tissue regeneration. The resulting platelet-rich plasma is then injected into the balding parts of the scalp. This process stimulates hair growth and improves hair density by enhancing the blood supply and cellular regeneration. Multiple review studies that have looked at all the available evidence have concluded that PRP is effective against hair loss and is probably slightly more effective than finasteride. Though PRP is cost prohibitively expensive, painful, and time consuming. The main point here with confirmed evidence is that improved blood flow improves hair growth as literally injecting part of our blood back into our scalp results in drastic hair growth. Microneedling is another treatment that has gained popularity in the last decade. Most commonly, it's used in combination with minoxidil as it helps increase its absorption and boost regrowth by up to three and a half times. But recent studies show that microneedling will work on its own as a standalone therapy without any minoxidil. And when used in this way, it will typically give regrowth that exceeds that of minoxidil monotherapy. Nobody knows for sure exactly how microneedling works, 
but it's very likely that it involves the stimulation of a signaling protein called vascular endothelial growth factor, often referred to as VEGF. VEGF sends a signal to the tissues surrounding the hair follicles to increase their production of blood vessels. The result is an increase in the total amount of blood supplied to the follicle and eventually its regeneration from a dormant state back into an active state. An equally exciting development of the past decade involves muscle relaxing injections into the scalp perimeter muscles. These injections cause flaccid paralysis of the muscles holding the scalp in place, meaning the muscles go limp and the downward tension on the scalp is reduced. With the tension decreased, the blood vessels can once again properly supply the balding areas. The result is an impressive amount of regrowth, which can be achieved in as little as two and even one session. According to the authors of the study that made this discovery, quote, injections of botulinum toxin relaxes the muscle, which reduces pressure on the musculocutaneous and perforating vasculature, thereby potentially increasing the blood supply. This increased blood flow can also lead to washing out of accumulated DHT, thereby reducing the signal for miniaturization of hair follicles. Another reason why blood flow came to the attention of hair loss researchers is the mysterious pattern found in male pattern baldness. Why does hair loss even take place in this stereotypical pattern? No one could come up with a good reason for this question until they looked at the amount of tension across the entire scalp using computer models. The tension patterns looked exactly like the Hamilton Norwood scale of hair loss. Could it be that this tension in the scalp reduces the blood flow in the vasculature surrounding the hair follicle bulbs, either directly by constricting the blood vessels or indirectly by causing chronic inflammation, resulting in fibrosis, which then subsequently constricted the blood vessels? Perhaps both. Either way, to date, the scalp tension theory is the only viable explanation for the very specific pattern found in male androgenetic hair loss. And since DHT plays a role in fibrosis, this is why we don't see female hair loss exhibiting the same pattern. It's only in men with DHT and scalp tension. Furthermore, we can look at hair transplants. Hair transplants are fascinating because we take hair from the back of the head and transplant it to the front. Now on the surface, it looks like this opposes the blood flow theory completely. How can those transplanted hairs grow when we've shown that the blood flow is reduced in those areas, but looking a little deeper reveals a different story. Almost all patients who get a hair transplant also take finasteride. Now, if some of those people had taken finasteride since the early stages of hair loss, they wouldn't have lost any hair anyway. So we can't include those people when assessing this theory. For hair transplant patients who don't take finasteride, what they find is about five to 10 years after that those transplanted hairs do start thinning. Meanwhile, the hairs in the back of the head in the donor area are still perfectly healthy and growing with no loss of thickness whatsoever. This clearly shows that the location on the scalp is an important factor in whether the hair grows or starts thinning. Knowing this, scientists and engineers from the University of Bristol and the University of Birmingham in the UK have designed a device that is specifically used to increase blood flow and reduce the chronic tension found across the scalp. It's a device called the Grow Band, and it's been gaining massive popularity because it works by addressing the specific root cause of hair loss. The Grow Band pushes upwards, reducing the tension on the scalp and also pinching and squeezing the dermis at the top of the scalp to help remodel the present fibrosis. It's essentially a powerful, controlled, and standardized scalp massage designed by hair loss researchers and engineers to focus on the underlying cause of hair loss. Users are getting great results alone, although, many find the best results when used in combination with other standard treatments like minoxidil and finasteride. The grow band is particularly powerful when used with a DHT blocker because you're attacking the two main root causes of hair loss. You can learn more about the grow band over at hairguard.com. So what do you think about blood flow and hair growth? I want to hear your thoughts and your theories. And if you have any doubts at all, please tell us why in the comment section so we can cover your points in the next video. If you think we're onto something or you want to hear answers to your comments, then please consider subscribing and make sure you check out our other useful videos on this channel. Until then guys, I'll see you all on the next one.